for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being a high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not only for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim. And there he remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, they should report it that they might see him. And Father, I thank you again for this passage. And as they spoke, Lord, the whole world would follow you, Lord. And that's our heart, Lord. We want all of Montgomery County to follow you, Lord. And they don't have to come here. They don't have to come to Calvary Chapel. But Lord, we want them to follow you. We pray and we ask for revival. And you can call the death to life, Lord. It's just words to you. It's, it's, it's something that's easy to you, Lord. So we ask that you would do it. We ask that we would be willing uh, to be your hands and feet in it, Lord. And so just open this word to us today. Strengthen us again, convict us where it's needed, and lift us up where we're downtrodden. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So in verse 38 through 39, then Jesus again groaning in himself, it says. And again, this is the second time he groans. That word groaning can mean uh, frustration or anger. Um, He's probably angry at the fact that they're weeping and they're despair. There's no despair for us. We, We don't. We don't despair like there's no hope. I put First Thessalonians 4.13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Least you sorrow at others who have no hope. We have hope. We know that those who die that believe are instantly with Jesus. Uh, so I think he's angry at that. He's frustrated with the mourners. He's frustrated with the thing that was said on verse 27. Yes, I believe that you are... I'm sorry, wrong part. <clears throat> And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also kept this man from dying? I think there's some frustration in that and moaning and just, there's emotion in all of this. He's still human. There's a lot of emotion. He's looking at Mary and Martha who were his friends and he's groaning. He's hurt. He's, he has wept for them. And he's not weeping so much for Mary and Martha as, as you think about it because he knows what he's about to do. They're going to be overcome for joy. He's not probably weeping for Lazarus. There's a part of me that thinks he does because poor Lazarus is going to be yanked from the way he was back to this life. So maybe he's weeping, groaning a little bit. I'm sorry, Lazarus. I got to do this. I got to have them believe. Um, But he's groaning. And and, and why does this deep emotion? I think he's seeing the effect of sin firsthand as a man. Right? When we were at the conference, one thing that stuck out to me is they talked about sin. And sin always leads to suffering. And usually what we do in our flesh is that suffering will result in more sin as we try to cover the suffering. And it becomes this vicious circle of spinning of sin, suffering, sin, suffering, sin, suffering. And this vicious circle until it leads to death. And here's what happened. And this is what Jesus is witnessing with his own eyes uh, in in a flesh form. There would have been a crowd here with him. Remember, there's Mary, there's Martha, there's the whalers. Family probably comes in. Remember, they would bury him the day he died. They, there's no week-long funeral. They can't put him on, on ice for a week. So he's, he's going to be taken the day he dies. They have the funeral. And then people come. Family comes. They're coming to grieve with them. And grieving was around a week. The cave here is probably carved out of limestone. That's what they were usually carved of. And if you remember all the movies, you've seen that big, flat, round stone that rolls in front of it. That's probably what's sitting In front of this. And I love the way the King James words it when she says, Lord, by this time he has a stench. The King James says, He stinketh. And I love how the Old English just says, He stinketh. Because he probably did. So I'm going to give you a little science here. This was, I don't know if this was fun or if that's morbid that it's fun, but there's four stages that occur after the body of death there's polar mortis, algor mortis, rigor mortis, and liver mortis. Hopefully I'm saying them right. The first one, the, the, the 
color comes out of you. You just, the color begins to drain. And that happens about 15 minutes, and then your body begins to lose temperature and drops, and I believe it's 12-ish hours, maybe less, depending on the, the, the external temperature, drops. Then there's the rigor mortis. You've probably heard of that, where the body stiffens, it gets tight and tense. What I didn't know is after that, after about uh, 20 hours or so, it gets real limber again. I didn't know that. That was something I learned this week. So then it becomes movable and, and bendable again. And then the liver mortis is where all the blood is going to flow wherever gravity is. So usually on your back, all the blood is flowing down. So this, then there's this kind of like stage one. And as soon as the breathing and the blood circulation stops, decom decomposition, I think I said it right, uh, begins to happen. And this is acidic and you begin to rupture and your body's beginning to consume itself from the insides. What I also learned is if, if you want to get rid of your wrinkles, just die because they said on death, all, all your skin fills back out. So you don't need Botox, just, you know, it'll fill back out anyways. Um, but it says that decomposition, decomposition got it right that time, uh, happens within three to six hours. The muscles stiffen again, 12 hours. Blisters begin to appear. The internal organs begin to digest themselves. And by three to four days, most of your internal organs have been digested by the body. Your eyes have rolled back in your head, have become liquid. Your brain has become mush. And your insides, not to get too graphic, are just mush. And you begin to bloat after the three to five days. And then there's just this stench that comes out of you. And no amount of sealing it and herbs and all the other things you can do can cover that stench anymore. That's why they did those things, because they didn't have a lot of time. So he's think about, this is where Lazarus is. He's three to four days. He is bloated, probably discolored. All the organs are liquefied. His brain is gone. His eyes are gone. So when Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, think about what is happening internally to him. And then he said, gives the command here, Jesus, here, we're not quite to Lazarus yet, roll the stone away. And this is Jesus, right? He could have commanded Lazarus come out and that stone could have exploded in a grand display, right? But he asked man to go up and roll the stone away. And there are times in our lives when there's something inside that's stinky and nasty and probably bloating and causing disease that we need to roll away and let him have access to, that only we know, it's only inside. And he asks us to roll the stone away. That's his prerogative. Again, he could do it if he wants. Verse 40, Jesus said to them, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? He's addressing Martha here because he told her that. <clears throat> At this point, it's not about the miracle that's about to happen. He's making it clear. What's about to happen is about the glory of God of God, because Lazarus is going to die again. You can see Martha, you know, she's the, 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 the doer and probably the saver and storer and keeps things all locked away as she's cutting Lazarus. She's probably like, maybe we should keep these cloths for later or something, you know? And Lazarus is like, yeah, might as well. I'm going to need them again. But there's that fact that he was raised is not the final solution. It is not the point of the miracle. The point of the miracle is, again, is the glory of God. I like the way Corinthians here says it. For it is God who command light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I think that's beautiful. It's the, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And how Lazarus must have looked at that face after he came out of the tomb. We never hear throughout all of Scripture Lazarus ever speak didn't realize that till this because I'm flipping through. I read that and I'm looking and I'm like, he never speaks. And I can imagine after this, he must have just sat and stared at him. He must have just looked and gazed at him on intently. Who, who is this? I, well, in many ways, he knew better than anybody else. Look at him. Look at him. He called me forth from death. Look at him. And he just must have looked. And we never hear a word from Lazarus, but he speaks volumes and his silence as he must just have stared at Jesus. In verse 41, I'm only going to read part of this verse. And they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And again, this made no sense in a rational mind. Now remember, they're under the law. They go near that dead body, they got to purify themselves. That was very, very frowned upon. And it doesn't say who rolled the, stay, the, the stone away, but the permission was probably given from Mary and Martha to go ahead and roll the stone away. My guess, it's the disciples. And by this point, they have learned not to question Jesus anymore. When he says, go roll the stone away, 
like go piss, pick up those baskets and start passing out the food that shouldn't be there, they've learned just to obey. And it's interesting, it's always step by step that the Lord leads us. It's always a little bit here and a little bit here. And I'm sure many times you felt like in Matthew 9, 24, of the father of the child who cried out, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking to Jesus, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And here's just a few points. He gave Martha a promise. And then he drew the attention to himself because this is going to be about his glory. And then he called upon her to confess, which she does. He didn't need her to confess, but he wanted her to confess. And then he called her to act. And that's what the Lord does with us. It's a step-by-step revealing. When Casey and I were in Pennsylvania years and years ago, and we were looking, and, and my, I went to work one day, and I used to have Wednesdays off, and I went to work on a Thursday, and they said, hey, there was this invitation to go down to Baltimore. We're starting a place in Baltimore. And I'm like, well, that was messed up. I wasn't even here and get a chance, but there's no way I'd ever move near Baltimore. That's ridiculous. I would never do that. And of course, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep and was thinking about it. And I'm like, they didn't even give me an opportunity. I mean, I would have said no, right, Lord? I would have said no. But it just so happens that a guy backed out. And of course, the Lord had prompted me and I stepped in. So for eight months, I worked Monday through Friday near Baltimore and drove home Friday night. The kids were young and would, would be home on the weekends. Well, after Eight months of that, Casey looks at me and said, we can't do this anymore. We have to be a family. And I'm like, you don't want to move to Baltimore. You don't want to go down to Maryland. Maryland's crazy. I don't want to move down to Crowley. You see the taxes. You see how the things that they're doing in their government. Maryland's crazy. Why would I do that? And if you would have told me at that point, Matt, the reason God's bringing you here is because he's going to send you to Cambodia four times, and you're never going to be able to afford that, but he's going to provide every time. Your pastor down there is going to ask you one time to stand in the pulpit And all of that was step by step by step things that if the Lord would have revealed to me all the way up in PA, I would have said, ain't no way I'll be standing in front of people in Gaithersburg, Maryland, Maryland preaching. But it was a step by step process to get me to that point of faith to have the confidence in him that he can use a fool to speak. So he gives us step by step. And so when he said to the disciples, roll the stone away, I have a feeling that they ran to that stone. It had been step-by-step instruction. Remember, he's almost at the three-year mark with them, and they have seen healing after healing after healing. And it was step-by-step. So be faithful in the next step. It might not make sense. It might not seem like, what? I can't comprehend this, Lord. What are you doing? You're telling me to roll a stone away? This doesn't make sense. There's a dead man in there. What, What are you thinking? He's decomposed. Roll the stone away. Know that he spoke and roll the stone away, and don't delay. In verse 43, Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. We take for granted so many times that Jesus prays and he says the word Father. Remember, this is shocking to the Jewish mindset. This is Abba, Adonai, all, all the, or Abba is father, Adonai, you know, Elohim, all the words that they would use. This is, this is unique. This is a unique relationship. When he says, Father, and then he says, I thank you, you have heard me. He hears us in the thick of it, in the heart of it, and we get to pray because we pray in Jesus' name. He gives us that authority to pray to him that we can pray and we can know. You can know. You don't have to feel you can know that when you pray, he has heard it. <clears throat> and you always hear me, Jesus says. And because he always heard Jesus, and Jesus imparted his righteousness onto him, and we are filled with the Holy Spirit, when we pray, you can know, and you can always know that the Father hears you. No matter what, no matter how distant you have been, he always hears you. And it's interesting when he's praying here, he's praying like Lazarus is already alive, isn't he? He's already, he's already past that point. And the other thing Jesus doesn't do, and again, it's Jesus. There's no wrangling with God in this, right? Like, Lord, if you let Lazarus raise from the dead, I'm going to go fast for a week. Have you ever done that? Like, Lord, if you do this, like, we can can make a compromise like God, like he wants anything from us. He doesn't want, he just wants us. He wants to be with us, near us, and, and, and before us. So we can't wrangle with God. So Jesus just... 
lays it out there. You hear, there's no manipulating. And don't we try to do that? We try to manipulate God into doing what we want because we want what we want and not recognize that he's good. And he will give us what's way better. And one other thing to take note of, I remember being a kid and we'd have these prayer meetings and there was a guy who would stand up and he'd start praying in old English, like the old King James. And he would pray and pray and pray. Notice Jesus' prayers are like two to three minutes. They're not long. And in fact, he warns us not to get into those vain repetitions, right? The, the Matt, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard by their many words. And what do we all do, our Father who art in heaven? And we, we pray it like a robot, right? We do exactly what he says not to do. When we pray, we pray from the heart. And it doesn't have to be a lot of words. It doesn't have to be trying to draw his attention. You already have his attention. You just pray and know that he's listening. And now to the climax of the story. Now when he had said these things, he had cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And I imagine at this point when he said these words, because he's saying it in a loud voice, what did that voice sound like? I think all of heaven went silent. I think all of darkness began to shudder. I think Satan was wiping sweat off his brow when he heard Jesus was crying out with a loud voice. And death fled when Jesus spoke and said, Lazarus, come forth. Because this was the same God in Genesis 1.16. He said he made the stars in the sky. And the, oh yeah, by the way, he made the stars, he says after that. He made the, the heaven and the moon and, the, and all that. And then in the afterthought, he made the stars. He spoke over 100 to 200 billion galaxies in our, out there. And he spoke them into existence. And it was an afterthought. So that voice, when that voice speaks, Lazarus, come forth. It is all power, all authority right there speaking. And there's no hindering Lazarus coming out. He's going to come out. And Lazarus' ears don't work, by the way. So now go back to what we were talking about. All his eternal organs are are coming back to life. That heart is reestablishing because it has decomposed. His brain is coming back out. The neural pathways that were in his brain are reconnecting. His eyes are coming back in the socket. All the fluids, the blood is beginning to, to flow. And it's by that power of that word, Lazarus come forth. And there's many who said, if he would have just said, come forth, the whole graveyard would have came out. I think it's more than that. If he would have said, game, come forth, it would have been from Adam till that point of time would have burst out of their graves because that's the power that's when that word that comes out of his mouth. So who are we to ever doubt when he speaks into our life? And when he says, roll the stone away, you better run to that stone and roll the stone away. And there will come a day that he is going to to speak, and it says in John 5, 28, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which those who are in the graves will hear his voice, and all will come out. They're all, all of us are going to come out of the graves and meet Jesus in the air. There's coming a time he's going to just say, come forth, and it's not going to be specific to one person. It will be all of us, and that's what we're waiting for, and we'll get more into that when we get to the prophecy update. There's there's a lot of theories about what happened with Lazarus here because for when they, they would wrap him, they would wrap, it, it says his head and his foot were gra- wrapped with grave clothes. So his face was wrapped separate than his body and they wrapped those things really tight. So are there those who believe that it was in a lot of different commentary, especially like the older ones, that they think he literally just floated up and floated out of the grave and, and was just standing there because he couldn't move. He was wrapped so tight. So in verse 44, with that in mind, I don't, I don't know if it happened that way or not. And when he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with cloths, Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. I like this one commentator said, our faith in Christ's ability to raise the dead robs death of its sting and the grave of its victory. And again, when he said, loose him and let him go, that's the mouth of God giving a command. And that's what happens when, when someone is born again, born, born from death, born into life now. They're still wrapped in those grave clothes. And one commentator is being really, really stung to me. It's our honor and our privilege to go take those old rags off that person and to help them unwrap and unbound them. And we do that with prayer and walking with them. As they're a new believer, they still might have that a little bit of a stench of death about them that we're trying to remove from the world, right? So as we unwrap them, we need to be patient. We need to take our time with them because they're, they've been dead and they stinketh. So now we're going to help them clean up. And, and you can see Martha, right? I see Martha in this picture like, 
you know, as soon as the oh, shock was over, she's like, we got to get these clothes off him. He needs a bath. He really needs to bathe. I'm going to go get him a bath, Mary. Mary, you stay with him. I'm going to go get a bath because he still stinketh. So she probably ran home. So then many of the Jews, verse 45, had come to Mary and see these things. Jesus did believe. They did believe in him. How can you deny it? There's a man who had been dead for four days. He just wasn't on the table and then popped awake after a few minutes. Four days and all. They knew that there was, there was that stinketh and that decay that happened. They understood that. And there was those that believed. This is the final miracle of Jesus in, in John. Here are all the miracles up there. He changed the water into wine. Healed the royal official's son. Healing the paralytic at the pool. Uh, feeding the 5,000, walking on the water, healing the man born blind, and raising Lazarus from the dead. The final one is I'm going to show you that all these other ones pale in comparison because I am God over death itself. I am the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> so there's two major points I feel in this miracle. Number one, there's divine delays. Jesus takes his time. It's Jesus' time. It's not our time. It's never the way that we want it. It's the way that he wants it. He's not ignoring you. He's not upset with you. He's not frustrated with you. And sometimes the greater the delay is the greater the glory. <clears throat> so wait on him, be patient, and rely. And those are all the words we don't like to hear. <clears throat> Second, not only are there delays for God's glory, God wants you to understand that the solution of the problem is not the resolution of the situation. It is not a something that may need to happen or something that you need. It is a someone that needs to step into the situation. <clears throat> the point of the miracle was not to just bring Lazarus back. It was to, to identify the resurrection and the life. And that's what we need in our life. We don't necessarily always need the solution to the problem. We need Jesus to step with us into the problem. And then the problem isn't a problem because Jesus is there. <clears throat> A mature believer will accept the reality of giving them to by God and say, you get the glory in this. No matter the suffering, no matter the pain, keep me out of the way and you get the glory. Great example of this is in Daniel 3, 16 through 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember the story. We all remember this from Sunday school, taken up in front of the fiery furnace, bowed down, and they would not bow down. And they said eventually, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. The, no matter what, we're not going to bow. We're not going to compromise. He's going to save us no matter what. He's going to either save us in death, or from death, but either way, he's going to save us. And a mature believer will say in the state of opposition that you get the glory in this no matter what. And what did these three get to see? They got to spend time in the fiery furnace with Jesus himself. It's not always going to be standing in the fiery furnace with Jesus himself. Sometimes there will be a price to pay. But we know that when we pay that price, the, the resurrection and the life will be with us in that situation. 46 through 48, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and a nation. This is absolutely crazy to me. Crazy. You run to tell the Sadducees and the Pharisees that a guy was dead for four days with the point of telling on him. You know, the point wasn't to be witness to this. Whoever this was, it says, but some of them, and it was more than one, ran to the Pharisees. They went to tattle on Jesus because he rose somebody from the dead. The logic of this, where were their minds going with this? What did they hope to accomplish? Uh, and, and they're concerned. It, when it says here both their place and the nation, most people think the place is the temple itself. And, it, and if not, that's a, that's a testimony to where their hearts are at. It's their place, right? It's not God's anymore. It's theirs, and they're laying claim to it. And it's going to cost them. <clears throat> and what are they going to do? Go kill Jesus? He just showed he can rise people from the dead. What are you going to do to him? What are you going to do? Go kill Lazarus? They're going to try to. We'll get to that in the next chapter. And remember, there's two schools of thought here, so they're very, very divided. So the high priests at this point were all 
Sadducees. And they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in resurrection. And then there was the Pharisees who believe in resurrection. So you have these contradicting ideas that are both in the same place, but it didn't matter because they both hated Jesus, because they were scared for their place. And instead of going to God, seeking God, asking God what's going on here, being confident that God had saved them, they had gone through the Maccabees, what was it, like 70 or 100 years before this, they, they panicked, feared, and closed in. <clears throat> Sometimes evidence is not going to matter. Sometimes you can bring the best facts, the best debates, the best arguments, but the truth is the person doesn't want to hear it. And they like their place. And they're not going to be moved from their place. But that doesn't give us the opportunity to let go and stop. We keep praying. We keep pursuing. And we keep seeking the Lord on their behalf. And hopefully, hopefully the resurrection and the life will step into their life and wake them up. Verse 49 And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider what is expedient for us, that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So Caiaphas is the high priest at this time. He's in office from 18 to 36 A.D., he was a Sadducee, and again, the word, the term that year doesn't mean only that year. He was in office un, until death, um, so it wasn't that year doesn't mean that year. He came, seems sort of snotty, right? He comes off, you know nothing at all, right? And there was actually, uh, Josephus records that the Sadducees had a reputation for being rude even amongst themselves and to each other. And I guess you would be kind of rude if you didn't believe in any resurrection or, or afterlife, so of course they're probably a little rude, that this is all there is. And Caiaphas comes to what looks like a logical conclusion, right? If Rome's going to come down and going to take our place out, then let's take this guy out before that. It's a logical conclusion, but not a moral conclusion. And it's interesting because, again, this council didn't attempt to deny any miracle. In fact, it seems like they have completely understood because they were even saying, like, he's... The whole place is going to follow him. He's doing wonders. They're not denying the fact that these miracles had taken place. If you remember just uh, two chapters before, he healed the blind man who was blind from birth, and they had called him in and then called him back. They had heard the testimony that he had been blind since birth. So they had heard testimony, and that's only one. We can't imagine how many times, how many times were they investigating it, and they had heard. But again, it didn't matter to them. One commentator wrote, expediency was a problem in the first century, and it is a problem today. A person of integrity does not fear the consequences consequences of doing the right thing. He fears the consequences of not doing it. And their rejection of Jesus is not going to solve their problem, because in 70 AD, starting in 68 AD, Titus Vespasian comes in and starts to storm Jerusalem. By 70 AD, he takes over, wipes them all out, pulls the temple down, pulls all the trees out of the ground and burns them down. That's why Israel is so rocky today, if you ever wondered. He pulled every tree out so the the soil would erode and burnt the place to the ground. And that thing that they were trying to protect was gone. Well, another commentator put it this way, and I like this. Because when, when Caiaphas prophesied, he wasn't wrong. One man is going to die for the nation. One man is going to die. And there is going to be a drawing back of the people, but he didn't realize how long that was going to take. There's a great, and we'll go through it when we get to the prophecy and date, there's a great indrawing of Israel right now. There is more pouring in that to that nation since after COVID and even during COVID than there has been in years. They're, they're filling up. The population is going up. Um, but one commentator wrote about this, wholesome sugar may be found in poison cane, a precious stone in a toad's head, and a flaming torch in a blind man's hand. I like that about Caiaphas. He got something right, the same idea as the stop clock is right twice a day, right? He still hit something right, but he was still very wrong. 53 through 54, then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim and remained there with his disciples. 
Till this point, it was only, it seems like the lower priesthood, the, the, the lesser priest, the ones not quite um, high up in power that wanted Jesus dead. Now it's all the way up at the top. So now time is dwindling down. <clears throat> so now there's a panic. Jesus leaves, panic in them. They, they want to get a hold of Jesus. Jesus leaves. Jesus is in panic. He's never panicked. He leaves and he, he goes away and he takes them away. It's about 15 miles away, the city of Ephraim is close to Samaria, and remember he had a revival in Samaria with a Samaritan woman, and he's going to spend the rest of this time. We're going to get back to Lazarus and Mary and Martha next week, but then after that, he's just taking his time with these with the twelve. He's going to take time forming them, and he's, he's got a lot to say to them because these are the twelve that he's going to use to build the church. So he's going to spend a lot of time with them. <clears throat> and to close out, I'm a little early today, but that's okay. 55 through 57. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And they sought Jesus and smoke, spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. So they're coming to Passover. He's about to be betrayed, arrested, and condemned. It's interesting they're going back and forth. This is the hot, he is the hot topic of the day. Don't forget that. Passover's on its way. Jerusalem's going to swell to about 2.5 million people in several square miles. It is a tight place. Josephus records 250,000 sheep were going to be sacrificed during the Passovers during this day. So the place is loud. It is crowded. It's it smelled probably their sheep, and you know what sheep do. The animals don't have any control. They'll walk through the street and do their business. They don't care. So there's all these animals and sacrifices going on. And in the midst of all that chaos, in the midst of, of this, what has become a tradition that had a point uh, when Jesus prescribed it, is the Lamb of God getting prepped to be the sacrifice of the world. There's Jesus going to be in the midst of this and all of it. What spoke to me through all of this is when, when God speaks, when Jesus spoke. Again, I think all when he raised his voice, when he said, Lazarus, come forth, all of heaven went quiet. I think all of darkness was afraid. I think Satan was, was terrified and death fled. And it still happens today. When he calls someone to life, when he calls someone to resurrection spiritually, I think all of heaven is still. I think all of hell is scared because they've lost one and gained an enemy. And I think Satan is sweating. And I, death is running in fear because it lost its grip on somebody. Somebody will no longer fear him. And next week as we come to Easter, I was going to do an Easter message, but the more and more I just prayed and sought the Lord on it, we're just going to keep going. We're going to go into chapter 12. We're going to get to the anointing. Mary anointing Jesus' feet with oil. That's a beautiful gospel message. He says, anywhere the gospel's preached, this will be preached. So we're going to talk about that. And I, I think as we went through this, I think of Lazarus over and over again. When Mary was anointing his feet and looking at him, did he understand? And you think about when Lazarus was there, this is how my mind works. So Lazarus is, is in heaven, wherever heaven is before Jesus was there. I don't know if it was different. But wherever Jesus, he's there with Abraham, Isaac, and you know, Noah, Adam, and he's sitting there, and he probably is trying to listen to them, and they're like, wait, Jesus is on earth? He's there? Tell us his story. Tell us what he's doing. We want to hear. And in many ways, I think Lazarus was the first evangelist into heaven to tell what Jesus was doing and was excited and had them all pumped up. And then, you know, Gabriel comes up and taps him on the shoulder. Uh, you're needed. What do you mean I'm needed? No, you you got to go. No, wait, I'm here. And then boom, gone. Can you imagine that? He's there. He's sharing with all the patriarchs because this is a reality, right? This isn't theory. This is real. He was there and then pulled away and brought back to this world with all the pain, with all the suffering. But again, I think he gazed at Jesus intently. Anytime he walked in the room, I think he was locked. That is the resurrection and the life. That is the hope of the nation. That is my personal hope. And sisters, look at him. And imagine the story he shares with him till Mary breaks. And Mary comes and she's going to anoint his feet with oil. And anoint the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. 
So, Father, I thank you for this. I thank you for your word, for the story of Lazarus, Lord, for your voice, Lord, as you speak, Lord. May you speak to us, Lord, with power. May you speak to us and let us set everything aside, Lord, all the distractions that the world brings, Lord, all the things that we love to cloud ourselves with, all the entertainment, Lord, help us put it aside so you can speak, Lord. And if you have to, Lord, speak loudly. May you break whatever, you break our hearts for what break yours, Lord. Whatever stone we've rolled or need to roll away, Lord, help us to see it and roll it away. Lord, I praise you and I thank you for this, this word, for your message again, for the people that are here. I pray your blessing over them. And again, I ask that you would receive this worship and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.